Hello and welcome to The Last Quantum for 1994 as we continue our environmental journey through Egypt. Last week we saw how the construction of the Aswan High Dam had shielded Egypt from the devastation of flood and drought. But the dam that was Egypt's salvation brought with it new threats. Rising salinity, pollution from industry and a booming population. With a human tidal wave moving in from the countryside, Cairo has become a mega city. Amid the chaos, Richard Smith discovered how Egypt plans to shape its future. With accident rates in Cairo amongst the highest in the world, even crossing the road here is a challenge for the unskilled. It was soon obvious that these drivers knew how to avoid a traffic hazard when they saw one. But there is another danger they can't escape. Today, Kyrenes are out celebrating Pharaonic Easter. It's the festival of Sharm El Nassim. Now that roughly translates to smelling the breezes. It's a chance for an outdoor picnic and to take in the sense of summer. But sniff too deeply on any normal day in Cairo and you're likely to breathe in more than you bargained for. As the day warms, dust and fumes rise from the factories to the north and south. By the afternoon, the sun has interacted chemically with the gases, increasing their toxicity. Respiratory diseases have become one of the main causes of death. The sun usually sets well before it reaches the horizon. As day becomes night, a layer of cold desert air forms a few hundred metres above the city. Trapped, the blanket of muck settles down to await the morning and the whole process starting over again. could never have got this big without the high dam. With no floods to worry about, the city has expanded from one bank to the other. Now it's spreading along the fertile flatlands at a rate of 1,200 hectares per year. The Great Pyramids at Giza had once stood in the desert overlooking the green banks of the Nile. Now they overlook a sea of concrete, almost engulfed by the chaotic metropolis that grew up far from their ancient shadows. Maybe you travelled upward from uh, Aswan down south to the north. Didn't you notice that the ancient Egyptians built all their temples and monuments in the desert, they never allowed uh, to build a temple or a monument or a housing district on a fertile land or cultivated land. They built it in the desert. If they were aware 7,000 years ago about the need to protect the fertile land, shouldn't we, after 7,000 years, care about that? 7,000 years later, I was standing witness to Egypt's vision of the future. This is not a mirage. It's the city of the 15th of May. In desert land about 20 kilometres upriver from the pyramids, 
It's one of nine government solutions built on a grand scale. Instant cities built to have everything. Factories, flats, shops and mosques. They're all built from the same raw ingredients. Sand, cement and bags of money. But to be livable, they need heart and soul. And that's harder to invent. If I offered you a job in a new community, the alternative is to have no job and stay in Cairo. I think the decision will be clear. The choice is, is easy. It's not only the uh, social life of Cairo compared to the uh, tough life of new communities, but it's also a job against no job. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest job at hand is to green the desert. Not content with building new cities, the government plans to turn more than half a million hectares into productive farming land by 1997. But if you're going to pour money as well as water into the sand, you have to make sure that you're moving into the desert to stay. And that's a trick Adley Bechet is expert at. Now, let me get this right. This was all desert land here. This was 100% desert virgin land when we got it in 1980. To the left, you actually see a kind of uh, the virgin deserts of which we faced uh, when we arrived here. As a matter For nearly a decade, Dr. Bechet's Desert Development Centre has been turning desert to farmland on a totally scientific, totally integrated, totally sustainable basis. The wind pumps water from irrigation canals to the fields and orchards. Here, precious Nile water is metered out to ensure that every drop goes where it's needed and every drop is used. Crops suck nitrogen and other nutrients from the air and place them in the sand. The really impressive thing about this place is that you have to keep reminding yourself that six years ago, all this was desert. There was nothing here but sand, almost pure silicon. Now, the sand has become soil, and this land is ready for permanent agriculture. But while Egypt may be winning some fights on the land, it's at the sea that the major battle is being fought. Only during a brief two-week harvest season does the Nile have enough water left to flow into the Mediterranean. Now, currents scour close to the shoreline. Without fresh deposits of silt to replace this erosion, the sea is eating into the land. If you go there, you will see contractors, engineers are busy either building rowings or building sea walls or building basalt embankments. And this is costing hundreds of millions of pounds. With much land behind the shoreline already below sea level, any rise from a greenhouse-induced climate change would result in a catastrophic loss of land. Solutions being considered include the construction of a massive dike along the seashore, which would turn the delta into an expensive North African version of the Netherlands. There's even a staggering multinational proposal to dam the Mediterranean at the Straits of Gibraltar and the Red Sea to hold the rising oceans back and protect the coastline. What makes this threat immediate is that the delta itself is sinking. With no silt to match this natural subsidence, the land is slipping into the Mediterranean at up to two centimetres per year. I found myself at El Rashid, strolling through a scene from the end of the world. Expensive seaside villas abandoned in the last stages of construction as the ground below turns to a soggy tidal salt pan. As fast as land is being reclaimed in the desert, it seems, it's being lost elsewhere, 
to the sea, to salt, or to houses. The dam that was to free the people from the flood has instead locked them on a treadmill of problem and solution, limited ultimately by how far the water in the Nile can be stretched. Egypt can no longer feed itself without importing food. And to do that, it has to lean upon one of the fundamental pillars of its economy. Egypt is the gift of the Nile, then tourism has been the gift of the pharaohs. Millions of foreigners shuffle, gawk and snap their way along the Nile every year, basking in the warmth of the sun and the glory of the past. They take away photographs and memories and they leave their money behind. A lot of money in fact. Tourism is contributing over 50% of Egypt's annual foreign exchange. When it comes to keeping the country alive, rubbernecking is big business. Like agriculture, tourism is now an all-season enterprise, thanks to the high dam. The controlled release of water from Lake Nasser means boats can offer reliable cruises all the way to Aswan. The handful of old river steamers has become a fleet of 200 or more multi-storey floating hotels. No such luxury for me. But who could complain about this? Sailing the Nile at Aswan, complete with a proud Nubian crew. The desolate cliffs and hot sands of the Sahara hugging the cool flow of the powerful river. This is where the ancients once thought the Nile began, bubbling out from beneath the boulders of the first cataract. It's easy to see why the islands here became a favourite of Pharaoh and God alike. particularly the goddess Isis. This is her temple, built on the island of Philae. As part of a long and ancient tale, the annual Nile floods were once explained as the tears of Isis, shed for her dead husband, Osiris. The retreat of the waters represented his triumphal resurrection turning the fields of Egypt green. Farming was never practiced on the small islands of the first cataract, even in pharaonic times, because most of them disappeared under the raging waters of the flood. Now these low islands are among the last repositories of the original Nile vegetation, representing the lost world of ancient Egypt just as much as any temple. But these days, there are some newer temples at Aswan. The lost world is becoming a forgotten one, as developers rush to cater for tourists like me. Of course, tourists have been coming to Egypt for thousands of years. But whereas they used to travel in style, they now travel in bulk. 
If the god Isis was to revisit her favourite cataract islands, she would surely weep all over again. Welcome to the Hotel Isis, the goddess's latest home on Earth. Another enormous hotel development catering for yet more well-heeled foreigners and commandeering yet another of the shrinking number of undisturbed first cataract islands. The quiet beauty of the first cataract is what draws people to Aswan. But as mechanical diggers claw closer to a preservation zone only dubiously protecting the remaining islands, tourism is threatening to cut the branch on which it sits. It's ironic that as Egypt heads towards the 21st century, it's relying ever more heavily on its past for financial security. But this priceless legacy is succumbing to the pressures of tourism and assault-ridden groundwater. When a chip fell off the Sphinx's shoulder recently, it focused world attention on how vulnerable Egypt's future had become. Time is starting to run out at the other end of the country as well. 30 years ago, the dark outline of Lake Nasser existed only on the maps of the dam builders. But not even they expected that in another 30 years, those maps might have to change again. The silt, once so valued by Egypt, is now uselessly filling up the lake. It was calculated on paper very neatly and very clearly that this will take several hundred years to fill up. But nature have its own tricks. And the silt did not come to fill the place designed for it, but rather is sedimenting, is dropping, not in the body of the lake, but on the fringes of the lake, which is only natural. And there is more silt than expected. In the drought-ravaged nations to Egypt's south, the pressures of poverty and population have bitten hard into the landscape. Stripped of vegetation, monsoonal rains scour the exposed soil, running off in thick muddy slurries and turning streams into thick shakes. As this water enters the lake, it slows and the sediments settle out. Ethiopia's Mountains of the Moon are rebuilding themselves into a range of submarine hills 30 metres high and stretching nearly 200 kilometres into the lake. On the right bank in this satellite photo, you can see the Nile doing what the Nile does best. It's building another delta. As the entrance of the lake fills with mud and becomes shallower, evaporation oh. rates will increase. Already, a fifth of Lake Nasser is lost to the air each year. Officials calculate that they have only 10 to 20 years to deal with the problem. Given enough money and engineering, the silt can be moved, and it would be a fertile resource for reclaiming this parched landscape. But there are big obstacles to farming on a large scale here. As the shoreline fluctuates, land that is high and dry one year can be farmland the next, then underwater a year later and the lake can't be contaminated. This is the water that the rest of Egypt is waiting to use. Sitting on the new shores of Lake Nasser, a permanent solution to Egypt's looming problems still seemed a long way off. With so many curses afflicting the land, I wondered whether it might be simpler to demolish the dam. But it's too late for that. Egypt needs it too much. The year 1988 was the climax of a drought which had lasted for seven long years. In Ethiopia and Sudan, Thousands died of starvation and thirst. 
Without the dam, Egypt's population would have suffered the same fate. As it was, Lake Nasser was drained to dangerously low levels. But then rain came in mid-88, and Egypt had been saved. When the high dam was initiated, I was one of the people against it because of environmental attacks. But believe me, in the year 88, I realized that it was really a very valuable addition because it saved us from having the drought which the rest of Africa had. Egypt can no longer survive without the dam. But the comfortable feeling of having enough water is not going to last for long. The number of buckets waiting to be filled keeps growing. By the year 2000, at present rates of consumption, there will be less than a third of a bucket of water per person, per day. But does Egypt really own this water? Is it owned by the country that actually has the rain, or the country that has the outlet? Egypt shares a portion of the water in Lake Nasser with neighbouring Sudan. But seven other countries lie upstream, and all suffer rapid population growth. Consider Ethiopia, drought ravaged, yet supplying 80% of the water that enters Egypt. What if Ethiopia was going to build a dam on the Blue Nile tomorrow? There's no question about it. We'll go and bomb it before they finish building it. <laughs> I mean, it's our life. But if Ethiopia comes to us and says, hey, we want to discuss this, we would love to discuss it and we will find a solution which is good for Ethiopia and good for Asia. But if they go and do it and affect our livelihood, what else can we do? There is a real fear that the country's future could look like this, as squabbles over water ownership turn into battles for existence. Egypt might have an historical claim to using the Nile, but how long will diplomacy last when access to water becomes a question of survival for all? The High Dam has controlled the flood, but it's fostered a population now four times larger than when the construction began. As the population continues to grow, so too will the cost of solutions. Perhaps Egypt can build a dike across the delta, or help dam the Mediterranean if oceans rise. Perhaps they will find a way of moving the silt from the entrance to the lake. But for how long can a poor country go on building itself out of trouble? Finally, I'd reached the wall of the high dam. Here was the dam that was both saviour and nemesis. A dam so strategically important and environmentally contentious that filming for television is not welcomed, but where national pride encourages tourist visits. If there was a lesson to be learnt here, it had been written long ago. Look at what you see on the walls of the temples. They had rules advising everybody to rationalize the use of water. Considering the polluting of water, throwing something dirty in the water as a sin and a crime. And if they did that a long time ago, I think it would be a shame if we forgot that in the 20th century. It had been an interesting two weeks. I was in need of a drink, and it seems the world was in need of a new philosophy. 
a philosophy which borrows and builds on the best from all cultures, past and present. Above all, a respect for the rhythm and strength of the natural world, which nurtured civilization here in the first place. If after 7,000 years, we fail to learn this most basic of lessons, then never again will the planet see the human dynasties of the strength and endurance that still grace the banks of the River Nile.